motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome to this School for Mothers podcast. I'm your host, Danusha Melina Durban, and this episode is all about relationships at Christmas. And I'm joined today by Alexandra Stockwell. Alexandra is a physician turned relationship and intimacy expert, known as the Relationship Catalyst, creator of the Conscious Partnership Programme and author of her newly released book, Uncompromising Intimacy. For over two decades, Alexandra has guided men and women to bring pleasure and purpose into all aspects of life, from the daily grind of running a household to learning clear and intimate communication, on to creating ecstatic experiences in the bedroom. Sounding good. I like it. As a wife of 24 years and a mother of four, Alexandra believes the key to passion, fulfillment, intimacy and success in relationships isn't compromise. It's being unwilling to compromise because when people feel free to be ourselves, themselves and know how to love and be loved for exactly who they are, relationships become juicy, nourishing and deeply satisfying. Now, Alexandra helps build connected and happy families through facilitating healing and transformation for couples. When I was designing the Christmas series, this mini series on School for Mothers, it was obvious that we just needed an episode dedicated to relationships at Christmas. So here we are. If you Google relationships at Christmas, the results are pretty stark. The question, will your relationship survive Christmas, comes up a lot, as does the word wreck. Mm, That's not too positive sounding, is it? I'm really hoping, and I actually know, that Alexandra will have some wisdom for us. I won't keep you waiting any longer. Let's get started, shall we? So welcome. Welcome to today's episode. Denise, I'm so glad to be here. (laughs) <laughs> I, you know, I, it was totally obvious to me that you had to come and tell us about how we can possibly smooth those relationship waters and those tensions that obviously come up over Christmas. I mean, don't they? Do they come up for you? They don't anymore, but they used to. And I'm very familiar with this phenomenon. I think the reason that they used to come up and they don't anymore is because I fell into one of the most common traps, which is Uh that we all have images of how we think it should be, either because it's exactly what we had in childhood or much more commonly, we didn't have it. And so we want to compensate and do better for our children. And so we have this kind of idea of what the perfect holiday will be, which invariably isn't what occurs. And that is so stressful. Oh, it is. It's that gap between how we think sh- things ought to be and what we can realistically create, isn't it? And and also we try and step into what they want, whether it's our children, our partner, our family, what, whatever, you know, it might be exactly a party, anybody, even down to writing Christmas cards, if we still do that, you know, what kind? Exactly. Oh. I think the holidays just turn up the number of shoulds that we have to navigate. And there are a lot of other things that cause stress, tension, and frustration at the holidays. But I think far and away the biggest one is the gap between what our mind says it should be and the reality of the situation. And navigating that gap is Mm. what sometimes does us in. It does. So as you're talking, it has never occurred to me, (laughs) quite, I mean, you'll see why, never occurred to me to do a survey for my family, for a Christmas survey, a simple survey asking them what their hopes are for Christmas. I'd love to know, you know. Yes. And I would imagine that 
the younger children, let's say oh, four to eight, may have responses related to toys and gifts. Although yeah. Not necessarily only, but I think those questions are particularly interested, interesting with older children who have enough objectivity and inner awareness to feel that societal capitalist pull between acquiring more stuff mm-hmm. and just how good it feels to be together laughing and eating treats. Yeah, actually, it, it's true. It's the togetherness, isn't it, that we tend to really like. Well, I, actually, I don't know. Lots of people do really enjoy material things. That's that's their that's the high highlight of the year when they know that they're going to get their special whatever it is piece of tech or. And I do I do hear people say that, and and it isn't it isn't for me. It's it's the togetherness. Well. And And with real respect for anyone who looks forward to their piece of tech, I think part of it is that we've we've gotten confused about how we actually feel fulfilled. And Mm -hmm. so I really think of gifts and Santa Claus and the abundance of wrapped things to give one another as a kind of analogy or stand-in for the gifts of soul we want to be giving and receiving at the holidays. Oh, say a bit more about that. I like I like this idea. Well, actually, I think one of the ways this comes up is when a child has been so excited about Santa Claus and then starts becoming a little skeptical and asking questions. And the way that I think it's best to navigate that conversation. I'll keep it a little obtuse, shall I? Because we don't know who is, which ears are listening while the podcast plays. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I really, I'm 51 and I absolutely believe in Santa Claus because Santa Claus is the description that we give for generosity towards others in the holiday mm-hmm. season. And mm-hmm. I think it's so lovely when older children shift from becoming recipients of Santa Claus's generosity and abundance to perhaps being a helper for Santa Claus and providing Uh gifts for others with that same energy. And likewise, if we're wanting that piece of tech at the holiday or really looking forward for that big ticket item, while that can be very genuine, of course, I also think it's a kind of a stand in it's the it's the way in our society we have permission to talk about our yearning for more connection and feeling better and giving and receiving which really is a way to feel like we belong yeah yeah those to as you say to belong to be connected with others to be special to be of worth to feel loved yes to be loved exactly mm-hmm. and So I think the important thing is to really get clear that that's what the holidays are about. They're about being connected with yourself, being connected with the quality of your life, being connected with the important people in your life, and to have that be the central theme and then build everything else around that. And uh, one of the ways to do what I just said that is actually practical is rather than having invitations and opportunities coming towards you, children's performances, work parties, all kinds of things, rather than responding to all of that input, now, as you hear this interview, to decide what is the feeling you want your holidays to have and get really mm. clear about how that feels and maybe pick a few adjectives like peaceful or exciting or whatever it is that you'd like to be feeling. And I think it's beautiful when you have children who are old enough and also with your partner to decide together what what is the feeling we want to share at this holiday and then use mm. that as the parameter for the deciding 
which activities you want to participate in, how busy you want to be, because there's something magical about slowing down rather than speeding up for the holidays. Yeah, there is something very magical. I had a wonderful conversation with Sally Smythe the other day for this mini series about Christmas. And uh, she owns Queen Bee Styling. And so it was all about clothes. And we were talking about, obviously, what to wear. And she was mentioning about dressing up for Christmas Day. And I was like, wow, okay. I can remember, by the way, my, my parents, my mother, used to always buy me or, or make. She did a lot of, um, you know, creating beautiful outfits herself for me. But she used to have, you know, a, a special Christmas Day dress for me. But actually, what I, in, in the spirit of slowing down and truly cozying, which is one of the adjectives cozy that I would, <laughs> that I would, you know, warm, warmth, just togetherness. I actually love wearing pajamas on Christmas Day. I, we don't often go out. Sometimes we go out for a walk. I've been known to stick some Wellington boots on, um, you know, over my pajamas. I actually, it's testament to want to, to engendering and kind of embodying that slowing down that I don't want to posh up and dress up and glitz up and I glam up. I love that, Danusha. And I also think, I think that's so wonderful. And it's you choosing what you want to experience and then allowing everything to fall in place around that. And that really is the key to de-stressing the holidays. I personally don't think there's any moral superiority to being in pajamas and cozy or dressing up in one's finery, if that's the thing yes. that's really exciting. They're mm. truly equivalent. But the key is to be clear about which is the thing that's going to be most lovely for you and then do that. I think that is really principle number one in de-stressing the holidays. And principle... It is. So can I just say something before you give us another wonderful principle? Because I, I in, in having conversations about clothes and really getting clear on what we want to create, how we want to feel, I'm actually, this year, all I'll report back at some point, I'm actually seriously thinking about you know, making an effort this year to actually change, change that and wearing something. I've got some beautiful things and, and really, you know, wanting to do that. But I think what I notice is that when there's a rule in the house that everyone has to glitz up or, you know, dress up or whatever, it becomes a problem. And so what I want to make sure is that if I've got older children who want to be in their pajamas, then that's perfect. Because as you just said, it's equivalence. There isn't a better way. I think sometimes it, it becomes, there is a better way. And actually it's meshing all those different needs in a home that can get tricky. Absolutely. And in fact, if you're listening and you're thinking to yourself, yes, well, that makes sense. And actually, it's better to dress up in one's finery and curl one's hair and all of that. Or it's better not to, whatever the judgment is. I guess the thing I want to do is distinguish between actual authentic desire. You'd like to be in your pajamas. Someone else would like to dress up. Someone else would like to dress as though it's a regular day without either distinction. That yes. is fueled by desire. There's another thing which happens, which is, well, it's actually better to dress up. One should, one ought to. And if you mm -hmm. have any version of that, listeners, I suggest the very next thing that you ask yourself is whose voice is that? Because yes, those brilliant. kinds of voices are typically not your true authentic voice. It could be your voice, but maybe it's the voice of you when you were eight years old because all of your neighbors were dressed in finery and your mother didn't dress you in finery. And so you mm. have a need. And so now you feel that's what one really should do in order to have a good Christmas. 
Or when you ask yourself, whose voice is that? It may be your mother or your grandmother or a neighbor who teased you, whatever the case may be. I think in imagining how you want the holiday to feel and then how you're going to dress, but of course it also includes what kind of food you're going to serve and how mm-hmm. early you're going to get up in the morning and whom you call or don't call. Like This applies to really every single element of the holidays to really clarify what is your desire and then what are the choices you're going to make so that that's what you experience and mm. also contrast it with what's the should or the judgment or it ought to be that way and if if you have that to ask yourself whose voice is it really and sometimes just getting clear about it oh my gosh that's my grandmother is enough to <laughs> let it go and other yes. times it's not and then at least you can dialogue with that part of yourself rather than bringing your whole family along with trying to please someone who may not even be alive, but is a voice in your head. Mm, Perfect. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. That really encapsulates it so well. I love it. So that checking out is really important, isn't it? Getting clear on whose voice it is. I love it. Mm Mm-hmm. We're going to go on to tip two. Yes. So I think another thing that really undermines the holidays as something beautiful and heartwarming is when we let go of the things in our routine, which are actually quite important to us. So whether that's regular exercise or maybe you're someone who has time each morning to have a cup of tea and read a book for 20 minutes or whatever it is that you have included in your life because you feel better when you do it. Those are things that very often just drop away during the holidays because there's so much extra activity and things to attend to. And I really encourage people to go ahead and calendar those important routines put them in your calendar and treat them as seriously as if it's a church service. If you go to church or your child's Christmas concert, put that in the calendar because if it's there, you're much less likely to forget about it or schedule something else and then make it challenging to get it done. The thing which is less glamorous, but very important for your well-being. Yeah, because... What I'm hearing is that you're really saying, no matter what it is, those routines are upholding something for yourself, I presume, especially those routines that hold up, you know, uphold self-focus. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining you're not thinking about the laundry, for instance. Exactly. Although if you get some sense of well-being with the laundry being done, then schedule in time for the laundry to be attended to. Yeah. You know, I was, I was thinking that was more of a basic rather than dropping it. But those, those things that, for instance, fitness, running, you know, those things that, that are really important in our schedule because they bring a sense of fulfillment or health, whatever it is, So they can go by the wayside, can't they, at Christmas? A lot of people are like, oh, I've not had a chance. Exactly. And if maybe you take a luxurious bath twice a week, that's Uh, something that can fall away. I mean, each person, a a morning routine, an evening routine, I think working out is probably one of the biggest ones. And also mm -hmm. eating healthily, it's fine to have some extra deliciousness, but not to take one's consciousness completely away from priorities around eating, whatever it is that your normal is. I'm not talking about creating new habits at the holidays. I'm really talking about honoring the habits that you engage in the rest of the time, because they're just as important, if not more important in the holiday hullabaloo. Mm, Yes, exactly. So keeping that grounding going for yourself. Mm, Yes, definitely. Wonderful. 
My tip three. I bet you've got one. I do. This one is interesting because it's not in the realm of soul in the way the others are, but it affects the soul. And that has to do with finances. A lot of Mm -hmm. making the holidays wonderful, especially in families, correlates with spending far more than at any other time of year. And it's actually not necessary because in doing that, it prolongs the stress of the holidays. It takes it into when the credit card bill comes in January and maybe in February. And in the same way that we were speaking earlier about really thinking, what's the feeling? What's the experience I want to have? My partner wants to have any children old enough to weigh in, want to have at the holidays and then taking actions to create that. Likewise, to really think what you want to do in terms of your finances because truly a beautiful holiday can be created with any level of financial investment and gift giving. And I think it's really important to take that seriously and not just be carried away by how special it would be and ignore the consequences later. Mm. Yeah, completely. Yeah, we all have such different ways with Christmas and finances, don't we? I I always um, admire the people that do their saving for Christmas all year. In fact, I have been one of those people in different parts of my life, times of my life. And I'm not at the moment. For, sort of, for whatever reason, but you know, I'm, I'm aware that there are such different ways that we handle the kind of, well, what, how much we expect of ourselves financially in this time. And that's really what it is for me. It's not just, I don't really mean how much we spend. I mean, what we expect in terms of our ability or just spending on people on the whole Christmas time on everything. And so uh, how we, how we enter the new year as well, the, the, the kind of position that we enter it in financially. Yes. And while there are a number of good habits and behavioral adjustments that could be made, like saving a little bit starting in January for the following Christmas mm-hmm. or, picking things up all year long when they're on sale. I've done that many years. Mm-hmm. I had the yes. secret closet where I'd put things when I procured them and waited until it was time to give them. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of different ways of doing that. At the heart of the matter is sometimes I want to say, I want to say this carefully, we're all at risk for confusing love with money and having the amount of money we spend be a representation of the expression of our love for those we're giving gifts to. And I think it's very important to get really clear about the difference. And how do, how do listeners, how do we get really clear about the difference then between that money spending and love and the the expression of our love for those people who are special in our lives? What a beautiful question, Danusha, because it's um, it's subtle work. It's, I think it, it typically has nothing to do with the person we're giving to and all to do with what we're saying to ourselves. So I think one of the first mm-hmm. things one might do is just imagine if you were going to be spending, I'll say, a hundred dollars. I'm going to use US dollars because they speak Mm. to me more, but it really could be any currency. If you're going to be spending a hundred dollars to just imagine what would be different for you if you spent 200 for your partner or a child, and what would be different if you spent 25 and to just feel into what arises. Do you get tight and feel like, oh no, no, that's not enough. When in fact, any amount is enough. Or are you giving gifts in order to avoid some sense that the other person will be upset or dissatisfied and then you don't want to deal with what feels like rejection? There are so many 
actual judgments and anticipated judgments. And so journaling about this, doing thought experiments like the one that I said, well, what if I gave less? Would would the person feel less loved? And really, I think the way out of this challenge is to think what would feel most loving to this person and go ahead Mm -hmm. and see if you'd like to give them that. This is an expanded application of the principle of the five love languages. You're from, are you familiar uh-huh. with that book? I am. Yes. Yeah. Where I love it. By the way. Yes. And actually there, you can go online. There are quizzes for adults. There also are quizzes for teens. Yes. Where yeah. you identify the love language. There are five of them, uh, words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, gift giving. And in this Acts of service. service. Yes. And (laughs) so one way to separate the inappropriate marriage of love and money and then spending money is equivalent to expressing love is to think of the love language of each person that you're gifting that you would financially invest in and consider it. In fact, in, in my family, some of the best gifts have been a massage given my my teenage daughter who gave made me gift certificates of Aww. massages which was going to cost her nothing and yet it's so satisfying for me that that's one example or if if it's quality time maybe you make some cute little gift certificates and your holiday gift to your partner which costs nothing but the use of the pens and the paper are um actual certificates for a special date night once a month and you give 12 of them when you really look at how to be loving in a way that feels good to you and feels l- really nourishing to the person you're giving it to, there's a whole new realm of gifting that becomes possible. And that is another way to disengage love and money and expressions of love as equivalent to the amount of money spent. Mm, Perfect. Absolutely. I love love languages. I mean, I've done them with um, apart from the triplets, so seven of the children, my children, and they're so important. And I, I really adore the way that uh, the distinction of the way that we tend to show love is often, I mean, for a start, it's generally not the way that the person that we're giving it to feels loved, but it, it does give us a very good um, idea uh, into the way that we feel loved. So if somebody is sh- showering you with, I don't know, thoughtful, thoughtful gifts, you know, little thoughtful things, then you can be pretty sure that that's how they feel loved. And and it might not hit home, might it? It might not actually engender the love that they're hoping because actually yours might be quality time. So they don't have much time, but they shower you with gifts. And these don't need to be expensive gifts, of course, but if it, it'll not land so it, it is really, it's something I work with, but also I'm really attentive to, and not that I do it well, by the way, but attentive to in my family. And does it influence what you, what you gift in terms of holiday gifts or in um, how you are with one another during the holidays in some explicit ways? Yes, I think it does. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. It, it definitely does. Um, I think the trick, the, the, the thing that I found is that when my awareness shifts off love languages, I can get caught up in, I just forget it. I forget that that's the heart. What this is about, and you know, this holiday season is about showing great love. It For me, it isn't about giving expensive presents. It's a lovely opportunity to give something that somebody really would love. But it's not about a demonstration of 
financial fluidity, if you like, and a kind of, well, yes, I, I managed to buy you X amount of things that would cost this much. No. So I think it really does fundamentally change the uh, way that that I gift things. So it was my daughter's birthday. When was it? Uh, last year. I mean, obviously she has one a year. We know this. But the one <laughs> I'm thinking of, <laughs> yes, she's not an unusual person. Although I do have, I do have a child with uh, a leap year child. So he doesn't have one every year. So oh, I'm forgiven. <laughs> I'm forgiven for, mm-hmm. for, uh, for, for saying that. But actually I have a, a, a child who, who was born on the 28th of February and, and very nearly was born on a leap year day because it also was a leap year that time. I almost had two children. So, but anyway, back to Isadora, she, I was thinking what would be great for one particular birthday. And, and I just knew that, what you know, she's a, a very ardent feminist and very vocal and really proud and stands in her feminism. And so, you know, there were, and it was a special birthday. It was her 18th. And I've thought about all sorts of things that would mark that and celebrate it for her and something to really remember. And then I thought about her love languages. And it, it, what we did was a feminist tour in London together. And it involved, you know, a tour guide and some other women. And on this particular tour, there were only women. And it was torrential rain absolutely British torrential rain. <laughs> and neither of us like being out who does, but so I guess some people do. It's just not our thing, but it made this incredible memory, not just because it was raining. It was so funny. Uh, it was so not our kind of thing, but it was a, a brilliant blend of quality time with, there was a lot of positive affirmations in there because it was celebrating in remarkable women, women who had carved out the world for us to live in. And it was really bonding. It really was, despite the bloody awful weather. It was wonderful. So I think, you know, yes, it does inform. I could have got her, you know, an expensive piece of jewellery. And I don't even think that costs much, but I'm telling you, we giggle so much about this wonderful event. (laughs) I just love that. And I really think that is the crux of harmony in the home at the holidays is really finding the authentic way to express love so that it's received that way. You've given a gorgeous example of it. And it de-stresses the financial burden. And I also think another component of that is there is an age when children can understand what's going on with the money, with the stress, with the family dynamics. And as parents, I don't presume you do this, Danusha, but in general, parents continue to feel like that's all their responsibility. They're the parents, let the children be the children. And I think that that encourages a kind of entitlement and indulgence, which doesn't do the children a service to, Mm -hmm. in their teen years, for example, continue to give expensive gifts and not have them co-create the holiday. I think an important and very profound way to make the holidays more nourishing, more harmonious, more expressive of who your family is for each person, you know, that that came out a little funny. I just mean that each family has their own unique flavor and what's the way to honor that flavor Mm. that including the children, like you were talking about earlier, like what is the feeling you want to have this holiday? Uh And then what are the ways that we can make that be what we experience? It's actually a lot simpler to figure out how to create that feeling than it is to figure out what the feeling is or what the best expression of love is. Yeah, it is. It's really funny you mentioned this because I had a conversation the other day with two two boys who are 11 and, and they're not in my family. And I asked them what they were really looking forward to and they both said, well, gifts, obviously. And I said, so 
are you planning to give gifts as well? And, you know, how does that go? I said, no. And I said, oh, okay. Well, do you give anybody gifts at Christmas? They're like, no. And I said, oh, okay. And why is that? And they said, well, mummy, mummy wraps something up for us and and she she gives it like we've done it. And I said, but what about you two? And I said, when when are you when are you actually going to see the twins? And I said, when are you going to do that for yourself? Take responsibility. They said, um, well, when we're sixteen, seventeen, maybe. <laughs> I was like, wow. I was I I was really struck because it's the it's in what you just said earlier, which is the co creation of stepping up to create you know, to build the feelings that we want, it isn't about money. It may be that the child or the children wrap something. I've had gifts that my children have wrapped a toy from them. I mean, it's it's adorable, a, a picture that they've created for me. It's not in the buying of it. It's the very thought that goes into it that is important. So when we, when we, exclude our children from the creation of the festive season of this holiday, what I think we're doing in them a disservice. I really do. I agree with you. And I think that children have the great capacity to open gifts Christmas morning with all the surprise and glee and delight that we're familiar with. And pretty much to a comparable degree, children have access to the very real pleasure in giving gifts to other people. And I've actually striven in my own family to have the children make things as early as possible and as long as possible before they transition into purchasing things with money. Mm. Because like currently my eight-year-old has, there are six people in my family and he has already wrapped one or two gifts for every single one of us. One was purchased and uh, I took him. He wanted to buy his sister a piece of jewelry, but everything else he made himself. They are all wrapped and he can't wait until Christmas mm. morning. Yes, he looks forward to receiving gifts, but right now, there is more excitement in the giving of the gifts to other people and seeing their delight and their pleasure. And I think uh, we often forget that. I don't know what the tradition is in England, but more and more in my experience in the United States, at birthday parties, the family who's hosting the party will take the gifts home so that the birthday child can open the gifts at home. And I believe the idea with that is so that the children who are guests at the party don't feel badly or get bored or in some way have an unpleasant experience because there's so much attention on the child whose birthday it is. But I see that so differently because when a child has actually put care into either making or choosing a gift for another child, it's so unsatisfying if the opportunity to see the response is lost. And it is such a gift when a family, I mean, it depends how many children are there and the ages of the children. So I wouldn't take this as a hard and fast rule, but in early elementary school, it's so gratifying for the child who's given the gift to see the response of the recipient. And I think that's something that we can really provide for our children and bring balance between giving and receiving and create the empowerment that results from that. Yes, uh, absolutely. It, it's a loss not to have them really experience the joy that they can create unrelated to the amount of money that they've they've paid or not for their gift. And it also teaches some important lessons about reciprocity because life isn't isn't all about reciprocity at all. It's not. It's 
You know, sometimes we give a present and there isn't one back and that's fine. That's absolutely wonderful. It doesn't have to be, I gave you, you need to give me something back or I gave you a big thing, but so that's the wrong size kind of thing. And I think when we, when we coddle our children to an extent that we provide it all on a plate, there can be a loss to that. I, I really think there can. And so there's important lessons about this. There absolutely is a loss. And if we want to pull back to an eagle's eye view in really making space for children to be giving at the holiday season and for them to experience how lovely that is, it gives them an experience of impact. I think one of the best mm. things that we can do for our children, starting in the most gentle ways and then transitioning into other kinds of activities as it's developmentally appropriate, is for them to have an experience of their impact, how what they do makes a difference to other people. And there's mm. a way that we can build a brighter future where we're taking better care of one another in the world in general through these little precious moments of a child realizing that what they do creates an impact that would otherwise not have occurred. Mm. It's a terrific set of lessons in power, personal power, and as you say, impact. And it's, it's something that we can learn very early, very early, and it needs to be encouraged. And the holiday season is a perfect time, a really perfect time. But when we get caught up by the materialism and the kind of, oh, the just, just get swept along with all of that that goes with that, that we've been talking about, we can just forget the simplicity that is built into this. And, and that's really why I wanted to, I wanted to have this conversation with you because it's important to remember it. It's, re you know, really important to remember these tips that you've been talking about, um, things that we all know really, and not the tips necessarily, but these overarching wisdoms about what's important in life. Yes, I, I agree. And I think in general, the holidays are not a time when we become reflective, but it really would behoove us to do so for the reasons you've just said. And I want to add mm. with truth, clarity, and frankly, compassion, that just as most people have a birthday every year, the holidays come every year, and it's not about mm. perfection. This really is the kind of thing where you maybe go far in one direction one year and you realize, oh, that was too much. And then you shift it for the next year and it's a constant <laughs> yes. evolution. For <laughs> yes. me, it hasn't really been about mm, making it too materialistic, but I have had some years where the holidays were just too busy with a significant collection yes. of children and each one has performances and school parties and uh -huh. holiday parties with friends and family parties and my husband's work party. And then there's this performance and that performance and the number of activities that I have ended up committed to in the month of December is about as many as in the prior nine months. And so I had yep. one year uh -huh. when my um, children are musicians and so the, they were performing in the lobby of a bank plus their usual concerts and charity concerts at the nursing home and in the hospital. And if I looked at each activity, it was lovely. And that's why I said yes and put it in the calendar and got us all there. But the overall effect of each of those lovely, valuable activities was that we kind of just stopped breathing and we needed to recover. And just as I like to plan vacations so that I don't need a vacation from vacation when I get home, for me, mm -hmm. it's the way to really create the feeling I want and to co-create the sense of togetherness and belonging and all of the different things we've spoken about. For me, that really is in maintaining sanity in the scheduling and to really look at the overall month and responsibilities 
and use that to decide whether or not to say yes to an additional commitment rather than the merits of the thing on its own. Oh, yeah. I guess the one of the reasons that I didn't say about busyness is because uh, because I've got so many children, if I set up my life where I did everything with every one of them to that extent, you know, here, there, everywhere, all of them had, I wouldn't be able to cope with that. So in fact, I've done that and know how, well, insanity making, as you called it, you know, insanity, that it's, it, that it, I don't do that anymore. So I pair, I pair things back as much as I can. I'm really ruthless about it because there's enough on our plates in December without all of the things that we could be doing. So yeah, I think it's, I'm so glad you said it because it's actually the thing that one of the things that totally takes us down, women, you know. (laughs) Completely. And it's a little bit like going on a diet. If you are used to eating a lot of dessert, The hardest thing is to stop doing that. It's actually easier to then maintain that. You lose your sweet tooth. And likewise, I want to give people courage because it's hard the first year because it feels like you're saying a lot of no's. But I don't know anybody Mm -hmm. who's done this who ever looked back and wished they'd done more activities. And then you have a new standard, a new reference point, a new normal for the family. And it's much easier to maintain that in years to come. Oh, there is hope, you see. I'm (laughs) so, yeah, there is. And and I'm so super grateful for this conversation. There are so many nuggets of uh, wisdom in here, so many tips and gentle reminders of, of this holiday season. Thank you so much for this. Denise, thank you so much. And uh, I've learned from your stories. So I look forward to sharing that with people in my circle as well. Oh, well, happy Christmas. You too. A huge mega marathon thank you to Alexandra for joining me on the show again. What fabulous advice uh, that I have no doubt is going to come in ever so handy over the next few weeks. Listeners, be sure to take a look at her work and buy her book. It's not an affiliate link, I can tell you. I don't think it is anyway. I'll ask my team. Uh, You can find the link to her newly released book, Uncompromising Intimacy, in the show notes. I'm being a tease. We don't have a direct affiliate link to Alexandra's book at all. I just know it's totally going to serve us all. So that's it, listeners, till next week. Same time, same place. Meet me here. Thank you for joining us again. Here's to you. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 